All right, if you have your Bibles with us today, we're going to be back in the book of John. Um, we're going to be in John 19 through 28. Uh, over the last few weeks in the book of John, we have really shown off who Jesus is. That has been the big question, who is Jesus? Uh, Jesus, we've seen in John 1 through 5 that Jesus is God. In verse 2, we see that Jesus was eternal. In, chapter, in verse 4, we've seen that Jesus is the light. In verse 14, we see that Jesus is literally God with us, Emmanuel. Today, we're going to see Jesus as Lord. We use this title on the back end of Jesus' name, almost like his last name sometimes. But this title is supposed to describe to you who actually Jesus is. So today, we're going to understand what that means for us as a body of believers. And it's really important that not only that Jesus is Lord and give it a title, but more personally, is Jesus your Lord? Not somebody else's, but is he personally yours? Because we know from Matthew chapter 7, 22 through 23, that on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then... Well, I declare to them, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Notice at the very beginning of that, he says, many, many will call me Lord, Lord. Not a few, but many. A lot of you will call on him as Lord of your life. The end part of that is he says that these that call on him as Lord, Lord, in this way are workers of lawlessness. And that he never knew them. It, the reverse part of that is true. If the opposite of that is us who believe on Christ is that we are workers of righteousness. You see the opposite. And we know that few will find the narrow road, not the many. So we are, quite honestly, the opposite of what Jesus has just declared here. So know this, that knowing if Jesus is your Lord or not is very important. It's not, a t it's not just a, the end of his name. It has a purpose. And so if you are in the book of John, um, we will start reading at uh, verse 19. And this is the testimony... Of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So, so what do you say about yourself, John? Notice at the beginning in verse 19, it says that this is the testimony of John. Later we hear this, these words coming out from John. He says, and he confessed and did not deny. These are things that we hear in a courtroom setting. We have confessions, we have denials, we have testimonies. And if you would look down to verse 24, it says, Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. Now these Pharisees are holders of the Jewish law. And they had sent these priests and Levites so that John would quite literally give an account for his actions because John was baptizing. And if you uh, look at the, the, the second title or the second uh person that they asked it is, he says, are you a, the prophet? Not just a prophet, but is he the prophet? The prophet is from Deuteronomy 18.15, where Moses said, 
there is a prophet who's going to come from among your people, and if you do not listen to this prophet, you will lose your soul. So they're asking John, saying, hey, man, is this you? And John's like, no, this is not me. He said, well, the next thing they asked uh, is, are you Elijah? Why would they ask him if he's Elijah? For a lot of us in the church, I know here at North, uh, a few, maybe even five years ago, we went through, like, talking about what is the, the setter meal or the Passover meal. And a lot of us partook in that, and we'd walk through that together. At this setter meal, you would know that there is a place set at the table for who? Elijah the prophet. Why is that? That comes from Malachi 4, verse 5. He says, Behold, I will send to you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And so they were asking him, saying, Hey, are you this prophet? And what does John's count say? He said, No. Well, let's just turn and see what, what Jesus would have to say. I'll, I'll turn. Um, if you want to just listen, that's fine. That's Matthew eleven thirteen 13 through 15. Jesus gives an account of who this is, this John the Baptist. He says, For the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, he, that he is referenced to John, is Elijah to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He says it again in Matthew 17, 10 through 13. And the disciples asked him, why do the scribes say that the first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. They did, not rec they did not recognize him, but did whatever they, they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking about John the Baptist. Now look, we just have John the Baptist saying, I am not Elijah. And we have Jesus saying, yes, he is. And so there is this, it almost seems like a contradiction. We're going to find our answer, and if you would, turn with me to Luke 1, verse 8 through 17. This is where his father has, uh, is, he's, he draws lots to enter the Holy of Holies. He's serving in the priesthood that year, and he goes in to burn incense before God. And this is the account of what, what goes on in that. He says, now, while he was serving as priest before God... When his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord to burn incense. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah said, Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. And fear fell on him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you shall call his name John. Now know this, if the angel speaks and declares John's name, that is actually God speaking. God commanded, that angels do not speak unless God commands it. So God has actually named John. He goes on, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And here we go. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for God listen to this a people prepared not a people lawless as we heard from Matthew but a people who are actually prepared for the Lord to come this is who John was saying this is who Jesus is saying John is and this is who actually John is. He comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now we're going to go and 
the, we'll start reading the testimony of actually what John says about himself. In verse 23, in John, um, he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make way, make it straight, the, the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So this is who, this is what John is saying that he is. If you go back to uh, that that actually comes from Isaiah 40, 1 through 5. John uses this title, Lord, one time. Isaiah, in the first five chapter, in the ver first five verses, he uses it five times. Or, yeah, he uses it five times. So he's trying to get across a point that he is making a way for the Lord. Well, what is a Lord? You know, us Americans, it's hard for us to, to bow knee in submission to things, especially sometimes in, in things that are going on right now. We really don't feel that in us. We have a, we don't agree with that, that kind of control on people for a lot of us. But you know what? The closest thing I could think of is kind of like a monarchy in England. You have the queen, you have kings, you also have these lords, but the, the thought is, Sovereignty. That's what kings are for. Jesus actually uh, gives us a, a breakdown of, tries to show us what sovereignty is. So if you would, we're going to be in uh, Luke 14. If you would just turn back, it's just a few pages. In Luke 14, verse, um, verses 25 through 37, Jesus is going to... Uh, break apart a few things, and then at the end, on the tail end of that, he's going to describe what it is to have a sovereign king. Now, this is the part we want to get across, that lordship is costly. It's costly to have a lord. It's not freedom like we have here in America. There is some kind of submission, and, and Jesus will show that in in these two kings which come into battle here at the, the bottom part of these verses. But let us start in verse 25 of Luke 14. He says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them. All right, let's think about this. These are great crowds following Jesus. We already know that Jesus has fed 5,000 people. He's healed the sick. He's healed the lame. He's raised people from the dead. And then you're going to have people who have heard of this good news, who have come up beside these people. And you know what? They've not really seen Jesus do these things, but they're hopeful in seeing it. And so you've got all these different people following Jesus for a lot of different reasons. Yet some among them would say, oh, he's the Christ. But for the majority, he's going to turn and say something that's going to divide them. Now, you've got to think about this. This is one of the greatest evangelical moments in a lifetime. If he was trying to woo them to who he was, in a sense, by, like, fleshly means, this will be the one. But notice what Jesus says here. He cuts them to the heart. And I want you to note how he uses the law to do it. He says here, he says, Now, great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone, now who is anyone? That's anyone, right? Anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Do you feel that cutting edge? Jesus is going along. He's got Jerusalem before him, possibly the last time that he will go into Jerusalem. He's literally got the cross before him. You will note in the very, next, the very next verse, he says, if anyone does not bear his own cross. You think it's on his mind? He's got the cross before him. He's got a great multitude of people behind him. And he turns, and this is what he says to him: If you do not hate the most loved people in your life, you cannot be my disciple. Now, we know the law. We know what the law says, right? That we are to honor our mother and father, and that we're to love all these people. So Jesus, Jesus is actually using the law, what we know about the law, to cut us to the heart. 
and make a divide. As much as you love me, it will almost seem like you hate him. As much as you love me, Jesus says, it's as though you hate him. I mean, you could think that these words were not comforting to people. And I would not, I didn't look to find it, but I would think that not many people followed him after this saying because they could not grasp it. But Jesus goes on to say it down here in verse when he uses this uh, analogy of two kings. And this is where we're going to grab the sovereignty from. In verse 31, he starts and he says, Or what king, going out to encounter another king for war, no, all kings are sovereign, they have their sovereignty, right? They go out for war, will not sit down at first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes to him with 20,000. And if not, while other, the other is yet a far way off, he will send delegation and ask for terms of peace. So therefore, here we go again, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Guys, these are strong words, and they are meant to be strong. Jesus is not playing around with his words. Other, other places where we would see Jesus using this, this type of logic to, to really cut people deep is where he would tell us, if your hand sins against you or your eye sins against you, pluck it out, cut it off, and throw it from you. This is other parts of you bearing your own cross. Notice that he says, if you do not renounce all that you have, I want you to think of this. If you're calling Jesus Lord and we're not renouncing all that you have, but are submitting to the lordship of another, what is that? That's treason. That's treason against the king. It should break your heart that you've done this to the king. We don't deal with this lightly. It strikes us to the core of who we are. And it doesn't stop there. If, if you would, turn to Romans 1. Um, it, uh, the apostles, the... Paul, he, he actually goes in. If you look here at the beginning of uh, Romans, chapter 1, verse 5, we're not going to stay here long. We're, we're actually going to get into the middle, but I want to show you something about the book that helps kind of wrap your mind about what we're going to see on the inside. Notice in verse uh, number 5, it says that, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, and here, listen to this, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. So I want you to keep that in mind. To bring about the obedience of faith unto all the nations. I want you to turn to Romans 16. The very last uh, chapter. Matter of fact, it's second to the last verse. Look what he says here in verse 26. He says, But has now been disclosed through the prophets, through the prophetic writings, has been made known to all the nations, remember, all the nations at the beginning, according to the command of God, the eternal God, here we go again, to bring about the obedience of faith. So what he's done here in the book of Romans is he set it up and he says, this whole book, we've got a book in on this end, we've got a book in on the other. Everything in between is going to be about the obedience of faith to all the nations. The whole thing. So we're actually going to be in chapter 6, right almost square in the middle. We're going to come to, in chapter 6, verse 15. And this is where Paul is going to start using these words, obedience. And he's going to use another word called slave. And he's going to use these to, to get apart a real spiritual truth. So if you, if you, are, if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 6, uh, verse 15. 
And it says that, he says, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? I want you to note that right there at the beginning, he says, what then? That what then is attached to chapter 4, 5, and the beginning of 6, where Paul has laid it out and says, we are not justified by works. We are not justified by ceremonial rites. We are not justified by keeping of the law. You're not justified by circumcision. You're not justified by blood lineage. But we are justified by the grace through faith alone. And so he's laid that down. And so the thought in that is that if we are justified by grace through faith alone, then, buddy, I can just live however I want to. Isn't that the way? That's the train of thought. And Paul is entering into that with you to describe to you something. He says, are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? I would note that the we there is for believers. The we is for believers. But what does he say? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? What's he say? No, we are not to sin. We're not to do that. So let, look down to verse, uh, I think it's 15. We'll keep going. Do, look, let's, let us keep going. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? I, I will note that I have circled how many times he actually uses slave in this this little section, he lists slave eight times. In these four verses, he, li- he, he has the word obey or obedience four times. If you, um, like at this time in Rome, there was five million slaves. Forty percent of the population. Needless to say that the hearers of, of this knew what a slave was, Right? They absolutely knew what a slave was. Think back to John, uh, where, he, where John the Baptist actually, how does he view himself as a, as a slave of Christ? He says, I am not worthy to untie his shoe. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. Whose job is that in the house? A slave carries sandals. And so John is saying, look, I'm least of the least. I'm not even worthy to carry his shoes. If you peek down to verse actually 19, here in Romans, he he says, I'm speaking to you in in human terms because of the natural limitations. And what he's saying there, he's saying, I'm speaking to you, I'm using these terms like slavery and obedience, trying to get you to understand something that's happened inside of you. And because of the the natural limitations of your mind, I really want you to grasp this. And so I've used these kind of analogies. Right here in 17, he, he he really drives it home. He said, but thanks be to God that you who once were slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you have been committed. Now, now this... This turn, I will note that we, we have been committed to a standard of teaching. So for us teachers out there, there is a standard in which we do teach. We don't just teach whatever we want. There, there's a way in which we walk through things that we glorify God. And Paul is saying here in verse 17 that we have become obedient from the heart. You know, the Old Testament has a has a term for this type of obedience. It uses circumcision or the uncircumcised. And so I'm going to look back in some of the Old Testament here in Deuteronomy. (coughs) 
But Deuteronomy 10, 16, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn. Deuteronomy 36, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart, and the heart of your offspring, so that so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you, will, you may live. Jeremiah 44. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Let, yet, lest the wrath of God go forth like fire and burn with unquench, without being un, the unquenched because of the evil of your deeds. And it doesn't stop in the Old Testament. It carries over into the new. What about the preaching of of Peter at Pentecost? What happened there? That's Acts 2, uh, 2, 37 through 38. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to him, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were cut to the heart. Acts 7, 51. You stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Colossians 2, 11. In Him also you have, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. If Jesus is your Lord, if this is the Lord that John has come to prepare a way for, if Jesus is your Lord, the same Lord from, that John was talking about, you have had a circumcision made without hands, without works. Jeremiah also bears witness to this circumcision without hands. He says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on, my, on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall we each one teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord. This is a declaration from God. For I will forgive their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Jeremiah 32, 39 through 41. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever. Not a little while, that they will fear me forever. For their own good and the good of their children after them, I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. I will put the fear of me in their hearts. This is that heart circumcision. That they may not turn from me. Ah, listen listen to God's posture here. God says, I will rejoice in doing them good. This is God. He's even rejoicing in his heart and doing them good. I will plant them in the land of faithfulness. With all my heart and soul, God is saying he will do this in their heart. This is God's feeling. I will do this, God says. It carries over Ezekiel. I will take you from the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you into the land. I will sprinkle clean water. Listen to what God is doing to these people. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be cleansed from all your unrighteousness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove this heart of stone. will put within you a new spirit with, within you. I will, remove, yeah, I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put a new spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes 
and be careful to obey my rules. Understand that God puts his spirit within you and causes you, because that has happened, to obey his rules. God has acted on you and caused you to walk in obedience that John, I mean, that Paul is talking about here in Romans. Well, how does God do this work? How, how, if God is doing this within me, where can we look with our eyes and see God's faithfulness in the scriptures? So if you would like to turn to uh, Genesis 20, 5 through 6, uh, this is the account of when Abraham and Sarah were going in, and they were going in before the king, and Abraham told Sarah, he said, hey, tell them that you're my sister. Don't let them know that we're married because they'll kill me. They'll kill me and they'll take you. And so they had lied. And what happens? The king takes, takes, the, his, takes his, his sister, going to become his wife. And li- listen, to what, listen to what we can hear here. He says, uh, verse 5, Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? Now this is, this is the king talking to God. Did Did he not say to me that she is my sister? And she herself, he is my brother. Listen to this guy, what he says about his own heart. He says, in the integrity of my heart, in the innocence of my hands, I have not done this. Then God said to him in the dream, he's having a dream, yes, I know that you have not done have, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. God did not let him touch her. This guy feels integrity. What does it say about the ones sitting right out here today that you have all this integrity that you're walking faithful before God? Is it in your integrity, or has God not let you? So what we've seen here, the king feels like like he's done this in his own heart, with his own emotions, with his own feelings. God literally keeps him from his evil desires, in a sense. So God has restricted him of the evil that he wanted, that he would want to do, so he feels this integrity. So we have God literally restraining evil, all right? Well, the other one would be Pharaoh's heart, right? I mean, and that's in Exodus 4, 21. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. So what we have here is God restricting the king of of, uh, the evil that he would write to the sire. This guy feels integrity. And now we have God giving Pharaoh over to what he already desires. Those are two separate things. Pharaoh already desires this. God's just not restraining him. So we have the restraint of a king, and we have the giving over of a king. God gives him over to what he already desires, does not restrain him, and lets him have what he wants. If you would, we see this again in Romans 1, 26 through 28, if you wish to, to follow along, where we see this restraint of God used once again by actual Paul. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchange natural relations with those who are contrary to nature. And the men likewise give up natural relations with women. And were consumed with passions. Right? This is, they, they have these things. They are consumed with passions for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men. Receiving in themselves a due penalty for their error. 
And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, what? God gave them up to a debased mind. To do what they ought not to be done. So quite literally, God is showing this off in the scriptures. He's given them over to what they already desire, and he's not restricting them in any other way. Having a Lord it changes who you serve. Either you have the restraint from the Spirit of God on you, quite literally. Amen? Quite literally, we have the restraint of the Spirit of God on us. Or you're able to continue in the love of your sin. And there's no restraint from the Spirit of God at all. So either you are God's slave, or you are a slave of sin. That's what Paul is trying to get around. If you have lordship of Christ, you're either God's slave or you're a slave of sin. There's no in-between. There's no fence that can be straddled on this. Slave of God, slave of righteousness, slave of sin. No one's free. You're not free to go around and sin with no consequence. Lastly, Understanding God is lordship or lord of your life. It changes how you pray. It changes how you pray. Listen to David's prayer here in Psalm 51.10. Listen to how he says this works. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart. Why? Why would he say that? Because I see my sinful heart. Renew a right spirit within me, oh God. Why? Because I see a spirit that is not right within me, oh God. This is a man full of flaws. We know, a lot of us know the history of, of David. This is a man after God's own heart. This is the same... This is the same Lord from the book of John. We'll end up, I want you to hear this from Ezekiel 36 as we we end on this. Um, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into the land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I, God, will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone and from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. These are the ones who rightly call Jesus Lord. They are not workers of lawlessness. They are careful to obey His rules because God's Spirit was put within them. John 1, 33-34 I will I myself would I myself did not know Him but He who sent me to baptize with water said to me He whom you see with the Spirit descend and remain This is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. This is the one who takes away from the nations. This is the one who brings you into the land. This is the one who sprinkles you with clean water. This is the one who cleanses you. This is the one who gives you a new heart. This is the one who who removes the stony heart. This is the one who gives you a heart of flesh. This is the one who puts his spirit within you. This is the one who causes you to be careful to obey his rules. This is the one. This is Jesus. This is what Jesus has done through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Has God done this to you? Has God done this to your heart? 
Is he doing it today? As it is said, do not today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion. Let us pray. Father, we're, we're so thankful for your grace. We're so thankful for your grace this morning, Father. We thank you for your word, which holds us. Mere men does not hold us, but your word holds us faithful. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for blessing us today. Lord, we thank you for waking us up this morning. For every day is a blessing. We don't deserve it. But, Lord, in your grace, you give us breath of life in us. More than that, you gave us your son, and we praise you today. And we thank you for making a way for the undeserving. And the many in here, you be no telling the weight of baggage that you could have brought in. Lord, let them know that there's victory in the cross, and you can't work your way to heaven. Cannot work hard enough. You are not sinless enough to fall on that sacrifice. You have to give it up to Christ. Christ created us a clean heart today. And renew in us a right spirit. And draw us to you. Thank you, Father, for the day. In Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand. This altar is open. If you would have something you need to deal with, please come pray. y'all again for joining us this morning. I've got a couple announcements. Um, the secret sister, which I can't wait to be a part of myself, 
is today is the last day to register for that. I think we send that to office at North Albemarle. There's a link on Facebook. There's also a link in the weekly email that you can sign up with. Please. And if you're not on the weekly email, contact the office so you can get on the weekly email. There's so much good stuff in there. Um, the holiday schedule, there it is. You can read that. It's in the weekly email. It's on the Facebook. I've seen it on there on the website. Uh, maybe possibly it might be over seven there on the website. Um, pretty much office closed the 31st and the 1st, and then we are back here next Sunday. We will not have service Wednesday night. Am I correct on that? Thank you. Um, then the last thing is Discover North is in two weeks, January 10th. And if you are interested in becoming a member here at North, um, contact Pastor Jonathan or the office on that to reserve your spot for Discover North. Um, we hope you'll have a great week and we pray for us and we're going to exit out with holy water. I just did that at the band. They had no idea. Um, Father God, we love you, Lord. Um, we thank you for the message that was brought here today, God. Um, we pray that our focus is on you this week, Lord, that on nothing else, God, that you are our focus of our lives. You are the center of our lives, God. We are here for you. We thank you for that, Lord. We love you in your holy name. Amen. Y'all have a great week.